Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for having me. My name is Dmitry Kobak. I work at Tübingen University. And in the next 10 minutes, I will try to convince you that TSNI or UMAP visualizations can be actually useful and actually helpful for analyzing single cell RNA-seq data. So there's some background that I want to cover here very quickly, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about that. So single cell RNA-seq data, single cell transcriptomic data, um, is, um, is, a map, is a data that comes when people are profiling the gene expression over the large number of cells simultaneously. And the interest typically lies in studying variability between the cells. So there are different cells, they do different things, they express different genes, and we want to, to understand this variability between the cells looking at their gene expression. Neighbor embeddings, so algorithms like SNE, TSNE, UMAP, and so on, are methods to map high dimensional data to low dimensions, usually to two dimensions for the purpose of visualization. And the way they all work, and that's very important, is that they construct k nearest neighbor graph of the high dimensional data and then arrange the points in, in 2D so that the neighbors remain neighbors. And the purpose of that is to do exploratory analysis to get some insight into the structure of this high dimensional data that is otherwise difficult to, to perceive directly. And this became extremely popular in the transcriptomic literature and almost every um, RNA-seq paper nowadays prominently features a TSNI or a UMAP plot as part of the figure one, essentially. So the figures are pretty, this, that's an eye candy. People like to, to do them and to look at them. At the same time, there are very well-known shortcomings of all of these algorithms. And some of these shortcomings are obvious and some are less obvious. So for example, it's very clear that there are many possible features of the high dimensional data that cannot be represented in 2D, no matter how you try. So for example, if you have a non-trivial second homology group, like for example, an Earth surface, right? You can't embed this in 2D, um, no, matter, no matter what you do, that's clear. If you have a three simplex in the high dimensional data or a 33 simplex, no way you can represent this in 2D and so on. Maybe less obvious, um, shortcoming is that large scale structure in these two dimensional embeddings, again, any of them, TSNI, UMAP, anything, is often not very meaningful. And that is because all these methods only care about preserving the neighbors. So, what happens with the stuff that is far away originally um, is less constrained by the loss function of these algorithms. And then finally, even though all these methods aim to preserve neighbors, Arguably, they don't do that particularly well either, at least in many cases, because, for example, if you measure the fraction of nearest neighbors in the high dimensional space that is still nearest neighbors in the low dimensional space after embedding, then maybe you can get something like 10% on the order of magnitude. And 10% is not super high, right? So knowing all that, you can worry that neighbor embeddings in the transcriptomic context perhaps are more misleading than helpful. And an extreme version of this worry is that they're not helpful at all. They're just misleading. Like you're not learning anything by looking at these pictures. So that's the question for me today. Are they actually helpful? And here is, I will start with a, with a very standard answer to that, I think. So you've probably seen this already. So imagine I'm giving you some data set that has 70,000 uh, samples, around a thousand features, it's not immediately clear if you start looking at these features, um, what, is there any interesting structure in this data? Uh, and you can do different things to, to try to, to guess the structure. You can also throw that in a TSNI or UMAP algorithm and then out comes something like that. And then you say, ah, okay, it's pretty clear. There, is 10, there are 10 clusters in the data and perhaps you can even guess that some of these clusters um, are more related than others. And in this case, we can know the ground truth because this is an MDIS data set. So we know that all these clusters that you see are actually different digits in the handwritten digits um, data. So I think it's in this case, it's very obvious that despite all the shortcomings that I just listed and maybe some other shortcomings, um, TSNI and UMAP can preserve and can emphasize some meaningful and relevant structure in this data, right? And if, um, if somebody tells you that, uh, that a PCA or a random embedding or an embedding that looks like an elephant 
uh, can produce a two-dimensional picture that is as insightful, then I think in this case, it's pretty clear that no, they can't, and Tisney and Yuma go beyond that and do give us some insight about this data. That being said, I want to go beyond that example because in this case, we haven't actually learned anything new, right? Everybody knows that there are 10 clusters in the 10 classes in the MNIST digits. So, I mean, it's a nice picture. It's nice to see that. Have we learned anything? No, we haven't. So I want to ask, can these new UMAP plots can actually be helpful for learning something in the transcriptomic context? And I think basically the only way of answering this question, the only possible way is to give examples. We need to have examples of things where they were helpful, right? And this is like a proof by um, just construction. So I'm going to give three examples and then we can discuss the, the takeaways of that. So the first example come from, uh, comes from the work that Jan Lauser did in our lab when reanalyzing this data set um, from 2019 paper that it's a, it's a data with two million cells coming from mouse embryos. And the purpose of our paper was to study something called Pearson residuals, which is a data transformation. This doesn't matter for today. So we downloaded that data, which is already cleaned by the original authors, transformed it through our Pearson residuals, and then threw it into TCNI, and out came that picture. So if you look at that, then it immediately becomes obvious that there are all these little islands here on the periphery that look very fishy. That, that shouldn't look like that. So this suggests some kind of an artifact. And then we were digging deeper. And indeed, we found that these islands are expressed. These islands consist of cells that come from only one single embryo, different embryos, different islands. So this suggests some batch effect. And then we found that there are some genes um, that appear expressed in only a single embryo. And this is probably some barcoding artifact. One can exclude these genes, filter them out, and then you get a picture like that. The question, would we be able to find this artifact if we never looked at this image? I don't think so. There may be other ways to, to detect it, but well, that's the way we used. And I think it's, it just jumps directly at you and that, that's how it worked for us. And definitely, definitely was useful to detect this artifact that what actually went undetected in the original paper, right? Okay, example number two comes from a different paper um, that I took part in. So that was a collaboration with Tulia's lab where on, on experimental technique called patch seek, where the neurons are not only sequenced, but also uh, one can measure how they, how they fire and how they look. So Federico was, was patching all these neurons, then sequencing, and then we were mapping them onto these transcriptomic atlases coming from a prior work. And looking at these T-SNEARs, we thought uh, early on that they suggest that there is some continuous transcriptomic variation here. So for example, you, you move here on the left from like along this one dimensional structure. And these are, this is a lot of different clusters, but well, they don't look really clustered to me. They look more continuous and the same thing happens here. And what we found looking at our data now is that actually this continuous transcriptomic variation corresponds to continuous variation in how the neurons fire and how they look. So it corresponds to continuous phenotypic variation. And that was actually the main point of our paper that, that one should not think about these um, cell types as discrete entities, but maybe more showing continuous variation. And important for my talk is that we did have some quantifications of that that are unrelated to TSNI and not based on TSNI. However, we were looking at these images from the beginning of, of exploring this data. And this definitely did shape our thinking. And we probably would not have written this paper this way if we told ourselves we should never even construct these embeddings to begin with. So the third example, and my last example, is I'm actually going back to the same plot that I showed before. And you can notice that there are holes here. So that's something that I haven't really explored yet very well, but I'm interested in. So it looks like there's a hole here. Is it, is it a real hole? So let's cut out a piece of this embedding and only, only look at these um, cells. Are there non-trivial cycles here? Well, one can try to quantify that. Again, not relying on TSNI. So one way of doing that um, is to perform a leave one out k neighbor classification and then arrange these cell types 
along this cycle. And then the confusion matrix does suggest to me that there is a cycle because all the confusion is off diagonal and then here in the corner, which is what you expect if you have a loop. Is there other way to approach that? Well, yes, you can throw it, for example, in the persistent homology package. And I did that, try that, and out comes something that does not suggest a cycle to me. So I don't have a res resolution of that, but I suspect that there are many different ways in how exactly you apply that, right? And this may be a very naive application. There may be better ways. I'm going to look into that actually, but if one just thinks, well, you have some data, you throw it into, into this standard pipeline or you throw it to this standard pipeline. Well, in this case, for me, this suggested something that I was able to confirm um, and that may or may not be biologically relevant or interesting, but does correspond um, to, the, to the high dimensional data. Okay, so here's a summary. I try to argue that 2D embeddings can be a useful data exploration tool for two reasons. So first, they allow sanity checking and quality control of the data. And second, they allow to generate some hypothesis that one should later confirm by other means, meaning other analysis or maybe other follow-up experiments and so on. So in some sense, after everything is said and done and you wrote a paper, well, maybe you're not relying on this embedding anymore. So maybe there can be an argument why to show this in the paper. However, as a reader and as a reviewer, I definitely say, yes, please include this into the paper because I also want to sign it to check your data. You know, and maybe I will be able to generate some hypothesis myself by just reading, reading your paper. So I'd like to see these plots in there. And here's a takeaway. And I see these methods as a tool similar in some sense to microscope. So people sometimes criticize there are so many tunable parameters in TCN and humor. Yes, of course there is. If you have a microscope, you can also like tune this and that and change the depth and maybe you dye the cells or maybe you switch to from optical to EM or two photon microscope. There's a lot of things you can do. You will see different things. And maybe some of the things you see can be misleading. Um, obviously every single microscope will have shortcomings and so on, but nevertheless, this can help you discover important properties of your object of study, right? And if you want to, if you want to learn something about your object, you should look at it. And that's what TCN and UMAP and other neighbor embedding methods allow to do with a data set in this case. Okay, so I'll finish here and thank everybody from the parents lab where I'm working, especially Nick, Rita, Sebastian, and Jan, um, who also work on manifold learning. And thank you very much.